So good to see everyone. This morning's lesson is on contentment, and I do not have slides. I I usually try to do that, but I don't have it today. Um, I want you to think about all the way back to Adam and Eve. I don't know if you've ever thought about, just, just try to picture yourself on what was the Garden of Eden like. It calls it paradise. What would be your paradise? You know, what, what would be your paradise? What would that actually look like? What would that feel like? What would the temperature have been like? What would the food have tasted like? What was the scenery that you would have looked at? Absolute paradise. Can you imagine God made that garden specifically for them to enjoy? That everything that they saw they could eat. And I don't know about you, but I love some fruit when it is just right. You know, you hit a watermelon that is just right. You hit a, 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 a mango that is just right. I mean, there's just some fruits, man. It's, ah, oh, it, I can imagine the Garden of Eden would have been perfect in all of those things. And yet, Eve fell into a lack of contentment that I'm not happy with all of this that I have, there's this one tree that I can't have. And out of all of this that I have, I want that one, even though God says no. And so all of us, sometimes we get caught up focusing on, you know, well, I'm not a murderer, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not some of these things, you know, I don't steal. Sometimes we focus on, on those and we forget about the, the sin of coveting, that I desire something so much, I become greedy and envious and I complain because I don't have it. Uh, materialism affects all of us, especially this time of the year where we can get caught up in, in, in some of those types of things. Contentment. Contentment is God's solution that, that we just read about here in Hebrews that keep your life free from the love of money and be content. That's a state of being. What does that mean to be content? It means being satisfied, having enough. It's sufficient. It's a state of happiness in what I have. That's being content. I think about when we when you eat, you know, when you eat, there's times where I stop eating a little bit too early and I'm like, man, I could go for some more. There's other times when I eat and it's just right, uh, just right. I'm done. Like, it's just right. I stopped right then. And there's other times that I went beyond and then I feel too full. I'm like, oh, man, I ate too much. Contentment is where it's just right. I'm good. I don't need anything else, you know? And so as we think about that in all of these different situations, and if you guys are following along in your notes, you can see that, number one, contentment is a command. It is a command that God tells us to be content. Even before when, when John the baptizer, when people were coming to him, uh, he told the, the soldiers, you know, don't take anything extra. Uh, the, the tax collector... The, be content. He told them that. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 8, is, uh, Paul tells the young preacher, he says, listen, if you have food and clothing with these, or with these two items, we are to be content. In Hebrews, right here, be content with what you have. Just, uh, I'm good. If you live in a studio apartment, if you don't even have an apartment and you're living on somebody's couch, I'm content. I'm, I'm good. I'm, 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 I'm happy. If nothing else changes, I'm, I'm good. The second point is that sometimes I've, I've wrestled with this is what's the difference between being content and yet being a goal setter? You know, because Aren't we supposed to be striving to get better? Aren't we supposed to be striving for new goals and, and those kinds of things? That's a challenge. Like, how am I supposed to be content? Well, I believe, and you remember how we, we've gone through these lessons where um, 
I've, I've told you that, that I believe that God wants us to enjoy life. He, he wants us just to, to enjoy life and not just exist. And one of the ways that I know that is, one, he made food pleasurable. He didn't have us to eat just as a way of life, you know, like a crocodile. I said you could eat a big old deer, right? And, and the hooves and the hair and everything else, you just swallow it whole. You don't enjoy it. You're not sitting there tasting it, but yet it keeps you alive. He could have made us like that, but instead we have the sweet and the sour and, you know, all of these other, other flavors that we enjoy eating is actually pleasurable. God wants us to enjoy parts of life. And I believe that he also made us with a desire for more. I believe that's within us, that when we're in this life, we're saying, I want more. There's something greater. There's something better. There's something beyond this life. We want eternal life. We don't want to just live. We want to be happy. You see, those, those are traits that I believe that God put in us that we are striving for something more. But God, just like food, just like sex, just like all these other things, he put boundaries on the goodness of it. He said, yes, it's good, but I want boundaries. So I want you to strive for for more. I want you to, to grow societies. I want you to grow families. I want you to grow in your education. I want you to grow in your capabilities, but with boundaries, you see. And, and so we, we have to think that, are we going beyond those boundaries? And I think that that's one of Satan's tools is he uses that desire for more against us. You see, he uses that against us. Randy Alcorn did a study and it says that the average person by the age of 20 will see 1 million advertisements. That is an average of 4 to 6 or I'm sorry, 4 to 10,000 advertisements a day according to the Red Crow marketing article in 2016. 4 to 10,000 advertisements a day. If you think about it, we see so many advertisements that we can't even count all the ones that we see. When you're driving along the roads, you see advertisements on billboards. You see advertisements on cars. You don't think about it, but when you see the Ford symbol, that's an advertisement. Just the name. I don't have one on me, but if I had a Nike symbol or a Reebok symbol or something like that, that is an advertisement. You see, all of these things are advertisements that get us thinking, oh, maybe I want that, maybe I want this. And so we are constantly being pulled at. So my question is then, is it wrong to strive for more? Because there are verses like Ecclesiastes where God tells us to work hard. He says, whatever your hand finds to do it, do it with all your might. Don't, don't be content and be like, eh, that job will do. It's all right. No, work hard at it. Do a good job. Do it for the glory of God. Don't just be content to be like, well, God said I'm supposed to be content. And, and we'll be like, oh, that was a poor job. You know, but it. Do it for the glory of God. Do a good job. So God tells us to work hard. Do it with all your might. He tells us that if you don't work, you don't eat in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So we'd be like, well, I'm content. Uh, you know, I can survive. You know, no, you need, to, you need to work. You need to provide. You need to, to help. And that's the other thing in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16 that uh, he'll tell us not to be a burden on the church. He says that if you have the ability, because of your hard work and because it's you're providing, that take care of those so that the church doesn't have to take care of them, that, that they're not a burden on the church. So there's this attitude of, hey, I want to make enough so that the church isn't burdened. Proverbs chapter 10 warns about being lazy. He said that some people are so lazy that they don't even, can't, uh, it's so hard to lift up the spoon to my mouth. I'm just like, 
lazy, just lay there. You know, if, if you guys have seen some of those pictures of the dog, you know, they're laying down in their food dish. Um, you know, it's like they're, they're too lazy just to stand up. They just lay down in the food and just sort of falls in their mouth, you know. We don't want to be like that. We don't want to be so lazy that, that God tells us. He warns about laziness. Um, he also tells us in Ephesians 4 that when you work, you're supposed to work so that you have enough to share. You have enough to share with others. That's part of the reason for work. But the warning that God gives in 1 Timothy chapter 6 is he will say, do not desire to be rich. Do not have a love for money. You see, it's, it's not that being rich is wrong. It's not that having money is wrong. That's not what's wrong. It's when I have this strong desire that if only, if only I could just be rich. If only, if only I could just have more. You see, that's where Paul, Paul will tell Timothy that people have thrust themselves through with all kinds of struggles and pained themselves because they were striving for this extra money. You see, and, and that's the battle that we talk to a lot of people at DOC, and it's like, I can make a lot of money selling drugs. A lot of money. And it's not as hard. It's not as hard. So what happens is I'm tempted to say, man, I, I want more money, and this is an easy way of making more. You see, that's why cheating and stealing and some of those things come into place that I know some people that I would have never, never have thought that they would have stolen. And they were working for a, a convenience store like a Circle K or something and come to find out had stolen over $20,000 while they were working there. Sadly, I've even heard this within the churches where the people who are taking care of the money have, have stolen as much as hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you're thinking it would never be them. They would never fall into that, would they? But it's just so easy. It's just right there because of the temptation of covetousness. And the way to fight that is contentment. I'm good. I have enough. God has provided for me. So we are not to trust in these things that are here on earth. So the question is, is it wrong to desire more? It depends on your motivation. It depends on your motivation. You see, if you are desiring that, oh, I got to have riches, oh, I've got to have this to make me happy or to bring more security in my life, I got to be careful. I'm not, if I, it's because I'm missing something, I'm lacking something, I've got to be careful. But what if you are a hard worker and you just do a good job and thankfully in our society at this time in our life, if you do a good job in your work, many times you will get paid more. And you end up with more money and you end up with these, these, these riches, right? So um, if that happens, did, was your initial goal to become wealthy and to become rich? No, I just wanted to do a good job. It's just that God blessed me with more money or more opportunities, right? So we've just, we have to look at that as far as being content and how do I balance that. James chapter 4, he warns that he says that when you ask, well, one, you don't even ask. And if you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. He says that you ask for your own selfish purposes. That's why you're not getting it. So there are times that, that we can be seeking something and, and saying, I do want something bigger for a specific purpose. I remember when we were buying our house, I was like, man, this is a bigger house than I would have planned on. But one of our original goals was we're going to be worshiping here. We're going to be educating our kids here. We're going to be having people in our homes and we would like a little bit more space. That was part of our purpose of how we decided and planned for the house. It wasn't like, what's going to get me the most likes? Who's going to give me the most attention? 
you know, that, that wasn't the, the, the purpose of those things. When, when we looked at buying our minivan, it wasn't I'm trying to impress everybody, you know? It's like, you, I need space. I need more people to, to, to carry those with us, right? Um, how, what's our motivation? Why are you doing what you do? And so that's a mentality that contentment will help us with. I heard this quote, and I don't remember who it came from, but I liked what it said. Think about this. Be content with what you have, but not of who you are. Be content with what I have, but you're not content of who you are. Remember what Paul said? He said that I forget what lies behind and I strive forward to what lies ahead. He's like, I'm striving to be more like Jesus. Are you guys perfectly like Jesus yet? Or do you got a lot of work to do? Man, I got more work to do. Do you need to work on your patience? Do you need to work on your prayer life? Do you need to work on your finances and how I manage them and how I take care of them? Are there things that I need to be growing and striving to get better at? Yes. So don't be content and be like, I'm good in my spiritual life. No, we got to have this mentality that, man, I need more. I need more of Jesus. I need to grow in this area. I need to change. But be, at the same time, content of what you have, that what I've got is good. So contentment ultimately is a continual process, guys. It's a, it's a, 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 a journey because today you could be content and say, I've got this thing I've got this thing nailed and tomorrow something comes up and now all of a sudden I'm like, oh, if only, if only I could have that, you know, it, it, it's, it's something like, I don't even know how, how old are smartphones? They're, they're, they're not even that old. I mean, if we went back 25 years ago and said, Everybody's got to have a smartphone. People be like, oh, what? All I need is a phone. That's all I need. Just right there on the wall, just pick it up and make a phone. That's all I need. And yet, because of the way that this has technology and those kinds of things, guess what? Billions, I'm not talking millions, I'm talking billions of people have today. These phones that can access the internet and take pictures and, and record things and, and look up things and, you know, watch videos on and listen to music on, and it's all right here. That was something that before I would have been content and been like, I don't need that. And now today, it's like, it's, now it's just commonplace, right? So we could be content today on certain things, and then tomorrow it completely completely changes. So we've got to constantly guard our minds and our hearts, trusting him daily. And Paul says in Philippians 4, I have learned to be content. This is not something that you just, you just got it. You have to learn how to be content because it's something, again, I think that it's in us to want more and Satan just perverts that and twists that to use against us. And so I have to learn where my boundaries are and my motivations and, and learning that I don't need some of these things. We've talked about that with fasting. Remember with fasting, I learn that I don't have to eat every day. You know, that's, I, I haven't thought about it, but you're right. I'm not going to starve if I don't eat for one day, you know? So what about if I said I'm going to go without TV, you know, to say, hey, what if I went without TV? Is that going to kill me? You know, what is that going to do? I, I could go without it, you know. It, and so I got to check my motivations and why I do what I do. So let me look at, uh, here's some keys to contentment, and I'm sure you guys could come up with some more. But these are just some things that I could think of. One is trust that God loves you. Trust that God loves you. Whatever you have right now, do you have food and clothing? God loves you. He cares about you. He, you know, I, Romans chapter 8, verse 32, <clears throat> it's a tremendous verse. 
if God gave his son for you, he gave his only son for you, then what, to what limits will he not take care of you? I mean, he already gave you the highest gift he could ever give. Then all of these other things, doesn't it make sense he'll also provide that? Yeah, like you got to trust that he cares for you. Number two, that he will take care of your needs. That's what he says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Your father knows that you need all these things. So seek first the kingdom, and then he will provide for you. We just got through seeing that right here. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for God says, I will never leave you. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe that? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. You see, do I trust that day to day? Because if not, then I'm constantly seeking that I don't have enough. I don't have enough. There's something missing. There's something missing. And, and we're striving for those next things. Number three, trust that God owns all of it. It's not too big. It's not too hard. You know, that, that man, I don't know if I can, I don't know where this would ever come from. You know, I don't know how I could ever make that much money. I don't know how I could ever provide for kids. You know, I know that that's one of the things that some have said is I, I don't want to have kids because I don't think I could afford them. God will provide. Kids are a blessing according to God. And if you have the kids, God will provide. I trust him. It all belongs to him anyway. He will provide. The fourth one is put your treasure where you want your heart to be. Put your treasure where you want your heart to be. Matthew 6. You will be content when you're storing up your treasures in heaven, when I'm investing in people, when I'm investing in God, when I'm investing in the, the church, I'm investing in things that are eternal, then what happens is I don't tend to crave some of these other things as much. Have you ever noticed um, that, let, I don't know if you guys are old enough, but back in 2008, there was a huge crash in the stock market and, and some of those things, the uh, real estate market and some of those. I don't know you guys' financial background, but some of us were just like, oh, what happened? What happened? Like, I, I don't know. Because I didn't have investment there then if it crashes, how much do I care? People don't care, right? How many of you guys care if, if um, a certain Super Bowl a football team wins the Super Bowl? If, if they win or lose, you're sort of like, who? <laughs> Some of you guys could care less about football. And what that shows is you're not invested in it. Whereas if you are invested in a certain team, Man, you're going to look at the scheduling, you're going to look at the, the, the players and who they are and how good they are, and you're going to maybe buy jerseys, you might, you know, whatever it takes. Because you're invested, that's where your heart will be also, you see. So if you are, you know, if I go to church, if I don't go to church, if somebody is missing or not missing, and if it doesn't bother us at all, guess what? It's because I haven't invested in them. I haven't invested my heart, my soul, my money, my time. I haven't put that into this as a priority. Because when you do, man, it hurts. It means everything to you. It means everything. And so that's a challenge for us that battles against contentment. The next one, way to battle and to, to help us to be content is to put things in the right perspective. Put things in the right perspective. You know, it's like the foolish man who wanted to build the bigger barns, and uh, God said, you fool. All of this is, is, is required of you tonight. You're going to die, and then who's that all going to be left to anyway? It's all, it, it's all passing away, according to 1 John chapter 2. 
the, the love of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He said, these things are of the world. And he said, they are passing away. They're not going to last. So why am I so invested in those things? Why do I have to have that? Uh, Ramon and I were talking about this, you know, that I don't have to have a certain item to be happy. I'm okay if I don't have that, right? I'm, I'm okay. I don't have to have it that way um, because these things just wear out anyway. They, 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 they come and go, and um, things that I used to think I have to have, man, they're in the trash now. You know, those, those things I don't even, don't even have anymore. Letter F is make it your goal to give more and not to accumulate more. I want to be a giver. I want to be a giver. That, that's the type of person I want to be. It's not about how much I gain. Um, giving is an antidote to the poison of greed. I like that. Um, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, flee from these things, the love of money, the desire to be rich. He said, run away from these things and pursue instead. I want to be righteous. I want to be godly. I want to have a stronger faith. I want to have more love. I want to persevere. I want to have gentleness. Pursue those things. Strive after those things. That will help us to be content and then finally, we talked about this last week, be thankful. Be thankful. Because if I really start going through it, I've got more than enough. I've got more than enough. And if I give thanks for each of those blessings that comes into my life, then it will remind me not to strive that I'm not happy. I don't have enough. I'm being left out. I'm being neglected. God doesn't care about me. Pay attention to what you do have and be grateful for those things. In conclusion, Paul says, I've learned to be content with, all, with every situation. He said, I've learned when I don't have anything and I've learned when I have a lot. I've learned to be content with both situations. Either way, whether you have a lot of money at the time or no money at the time, I'm good. You know, praise God. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, I pray always that God will fulfill every desire for goodness. Huh. That all of your desires will be fulfilled for goodness. I think that's a cool prayer. Paul says, I pray that you will be filled up with all the fullness of God. There's something missing. I'm seeking for something. Let it be filled with God. Philippians 4.19 my God will supply. He, it's not he might. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Colossians 2.10, in Christ you have been made complete. Christ completes me. You're everything that I need. I'm good. I'm good. Amen? Amen. Guys, I hope that this lesson has just been a reminder of how important it is that as a Christian characteristic, an attitude, it's contentment. Just as Eve was tempted in the garden, she lived in the perfect place. Perfect temperature, perfect food, perfect views, everything was perfect. And yet, what, how did Satan tempt her? It's not enough. It's not enough. You're missing out on something else. Guys, we live in a great society right now with so much. Let's be careful and not fall into the temptation that we're lacking something. Let's have that attitude of contentment as we uh, go through this time of the year, as we battle so many of these things, and uh, give praise and glory to our God and the greatest gift that he ever gave us. If you're not a Christian, there's something you're missing. The greatest gift is Jesus. He says, in Christ you have been made complete. If you are not in Christ, you are not complete. There is something major that you're missing. You need to be willing to put your faith and your trust that God will provide for you. Be willing to repent of sins and be baptized into Jesus so that you can be made complete. But if you are a Christian and you feel like this is a sin that you're struggling with, maybe this is something I need prayers on, 
come forward. We'll pray with you. Let's, let's help each other. Let's just encourage each other through this life as we want to honor him and glorify him. Amen. We have a closing song. If it's convenient, right now is a good time to respond as we sing this song together.